now recording over to you Rowan. That's a good start. Uh, I was on mute. So can uh, everybody see my screen? Is that okay? That's good. We're getting a few nods. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you to Callum and uh, for giving me guys to talk to you today. Um, I know it's all very challenging for everybody at home and homeschooling and uh, and and uh, not being in school and it's tough. Uh, it's tough on everybody. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the work that I do. Um, I'm a marine biologist from Ireland. I live here in St. Dives. I've been here now for uh, about 15 years or so. And um, I'm very, very lucky. Uh, around, I've worked with animals all around the world, um, from sea turtles to sharks, uh, dolphins to seahorses. Um, I've been on nesting beaches with giant leatherback sea turtles, as you can see in the main picture there. Um, as an example, a giant leatherback sea turtle can be as big as, um, can be like half a ton in weight and the size of a small car. And the head is big as a basketball and they eat jellyfish and they don't eat fish at all. And when they come up on the beach, they leave huge big tracks on the sand that are like tractor marks on the sands. And we help, we used to help them uh, lay their eggs and then help the little hatchlings. But I'll talk about them in a minute. But I've been very lucky and I've worked around the world on many different species of, of, of animals. And just to give you an idea, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I um, hopefully the next slide will come up. We'll try it. There we go. I'm just going to tell you a teeny weeny bit about me. Um, and But my main point today is to talk about some exciting and amazing facts of all the marine critters that are out there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how to become a marine biologist if you guys ever wanted to be a marine biologist and help save and work with all the animals that live in the sea. And then I'll talk a teeny weeny bit about plastic pollution and how we can keep plastic out of the seas because it's the most important thing that we can do on land, even in St. Ives, and we're quite far from the, from the, uh, the sea, we can still stop plastic working its way into the river systems and working its way out into the sea and affecting the animals. So if, if you take nothing else from this today, it's very important that we keep plastic out of the sea and make sure it doesn't work its way from the streets into the rivers and then into the sea. So that's that's the most, one of the most important things. But I won't dwell too much on that. Um, I'll, just to tell you a little bit about me, as I said, I'm, I'm a very lucky Irishman. I've worked around the world. I've worked in Australia uh, with different species of sharks in Brisbane, uh, the bull shark, which is quite an aggressive shark. I've worked in the South Pacific, which is kind of nearly off the map here, further past Australia, um, working on coral reefs out there and, and all the different sea cucumbers. And amazing about sea cucumbers, some of them, when you pick them up and you hit them, they turn into a little bit of gel-like state. And then when you hit them again, they turn into very hard and they turn into very rigid structures. So, a lot of animals have different types of uh, behavioral traits to survive from sea cucumbers to sharks. And then particularly in the Caribbean, um, in there between North and South America, I've worked with a lot of sea turtles. Um, the same again uh, with sea turtles in, um, in Egypt and also United Arab Emirates. And even to big, great white sharks in the South Africa, uh, in South Africa as well, and other sharks in Belize and around the country and around the world as well. So I've been quite lucky, but. The reason I became a marine biologist was because of sharks. Absolutely love them. I think they're phenomenal creatures. They, they, I'll talk a little bit about them later, but they're just so amazing. Many moons ago, I saw a, a, a movie called Jaws, um, and uh, it just enthralled me about these critters that live in the sea, and I wanted to learn about them. So ever since a young boy, because uh, I grew up in Dublin by the coast, um, I used to go to the fishing ports up in Holt, where I lived, and I'd ask the fishermen for sharks. And they'd laugh at me and they'd give me a shark. They'd give me a dogfish, which is a very, very small shark compared to big sharks. And they'd say, that's a shark there. But I'd ask them for jaws, because I thought all oh, sharks were big jaws and they were all big, great whites, but they're not. Um, and there's so many different species. And that's the great thing about the marine environment. We get different types of animals uh, of many different species around the world. And even as one example, you have 22,000 species of fish alone. So if you say to me, what's your favorite fish? We might be here a while. If you ask me to name them all, we'll definitely be here for a while because I don't know them all, but I'll do my best. Um, and then you have lots of different sea turtles and you have 
400 to 600 species of sharks, you have another 600 species of ray, and you've got thousands and thousands of small, uh, smaller fish, all going from the size of fish that would sit in the palm of your hand to the giant um, whale shark, which is the biggest fish in the sea. And then of course, we also have whales and mammals as well. Here's a little tip, a little question for you, which you have a think about. If you think about it now, and if you could tell me your answer at the end, this would be great. I have a quick question for you, and that is, you know the big orca killer whales, the big ones that are black and white and sometimes you see in aquarium. Um, I think I might've given the answer away there now. I, I said the wrong thing at the start. So I'm going to ask you, what is the biggest dolphin, the biggest dolphin in the ocean? Uh, so have a think about that question. If you wanna do a bit of Googling, you can, there's no problem, but I need you to tell me what the biggest dolphin is in the ocean. So just think about that one for the moment. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and it's just to tell you a little bit about what is marine biology. And very much, as, as I've said, it's the study of um, organisms that live in the sea. Now the sea is a fantastic place. It has an average depth of a thousand to 2000 meters. In some parts of the sea, you could take the Alps uh, and you could take the biggest volcano on land or the biggest the biggest mountain range on land and you can put it in the sea and it will still not be seen. That's how deep the ocean is in parts. Um, you'll also find that um, there's, uh, it covers the earth. We, we probably should be called planet ocean rather than planet earth because the ocean covers 71% of our earth. That's a huge amount of salt water in the environment. And that's where life, life, has, life has become from and life evolves from. And to give you an idea, um, I just have a small video here. It's just about four minutes long, so you get a little break from my 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 tones. Um, and I'm just going to try and play it. Callum, if there's any issues, let me know. I'm just going to try and click on the link and see if it works. Um, and it's just a story of a young lady and how she became a marine biologist. So I'm going to see if it works. Let's just try it for, see if the link works. I'm clicking on the link. Hopefully it'll load and you'll get sound as well. Is that okay? Is it starting? I'm Rachel Butler. I you'll you'll have to change the screen share of course i will very good good point well done that's the way to do it uh we uh bear with me one second i'll do that now um good call otherwise you're going to still look at the same presentation zoom meeting controls and it's all falling apart straight away never mind uh zoom join a meeting we'll close that let me close this um we'll go back to screen share End slideshow, display settings, um, swap presenter, duplicate slideshow. Do you know what we'll do? Let's just skip that and see where we go from there. Um, so, <laughs> right, so that's like, this is the first, that means there's no videos, but we'll do, we'll show, I'll give you a link at the end and you can look at them at the end, there's no problems. So very much, as I said, so how do you become a marine biologist? When I was younger, I had a big interest in sharks, really loved them. So I wrote to the authors of many books and I wrote to professors in, 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 in universities and I wrote to many school teachers and I wrote to, uh, just as I spoke to fishermen, I said, how do you become one of these people who studies marine biology? So they said, you just study well in school, you make sure um, you get good grades um, and then you choose all the different areas that you want to work in and you try and, uh, and you get some volunteering and experience for them. And that's what I did. So I volunteered on a lot of projects to do it wildlife and conservation. And it doesn't have to be on the sea, because if you can, if you want to protect and work and, and, and support animals and conserve them, it's good to learn about all the different things that happen on the earth. But from a marine biologist perspective, um, we, get, we look at many, many different things. It's so varied, it's fantastic. Um, you can look at the smallest plankton in the marine environment, which are um, the smallest microscopic creatures that are sometimes called zooplankton and photo phytoplankton, which are uh, plant-based uh, uh, small critters. And then you have zooplankton, which are small um, egg types based on from crabs and everything in the sea. So you've got animals and plant and wildlife, and they work in a food chain, as you can see here on the screen. And a marine biologist can study the systematics of how these things work, that's probably more ecology, but you can also study an individual animal. So if you said, Rowan, well, could you study a mako shark? Yes, you could. And you could study many different aspects of the mako shark. You could say, could you study um, salmon? I said, yeah, you could. They work, they migrate from the sea 
into rivers and then they migrate back years later. You can look at many different things. You can look at the impact of how humans um, impact the marine environment through climate change or through plastic pollution or through oil spills. There's so many different things you can look at. And then, which is really exciting, you can look at how these animals evolved from the dinosaurs and how they migrated, how they evolved from, you know, Jurassic, Triassic periods millions of years ago and how they evolved into modern day. An example would be uh, millions of years ago, there was a shark called Cacarodon megalodon, big shark. And some, there was a movie called Meg, and that's what it was based on. And this shark was up to 100 feet long. So a number of double decker buses in a row and it had a mouth that three men could stand in and three men could sit in and each tooth was the size of my hand. So about five or six inches and they are related to modern day great white sharks, sharks that are swimming in the sea now and they're of the same family. And what they've done is they've evolved over time in the changing environment. So I guess the point I'm just trying to say, emphasize that there's a bountiful world out there in the marine environment, in the oceans that you can study from the deepest water, the deepest zones to the surface waters, to mid water, to fisheries, to marine mammals, to sea turtles, marine reptiles, there's quite a lot. So if you have a favorite animal you want to study, this is the place to come and you can get these, see these interesting critters. I'm getting carried away. I'll move on to the next slide. I apologize. Um, so a little bit about the ocean, just to, 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 uh, to give you a bit of background. As I said, the Earth is covered by 72%, um, the Earth is covered by 72% water, and the majority of this is salt water. You will find that um, uh, there is fresh water. Obviously, we find it hard to survive, we didn't have it. And there's a couple of lakes in the world that actually, I think there's one lake in Siberia that has up to one fifth of the fresh water stores in, on, on the planet. So you'll also find that with the different um, salt water coverage around the world, you have different depths from the shallow to deep to really deep waters. And as I said, really, um, there is two main deep areas that would be very easily recognizable. One of them, I can't really point here, but one of them is off the coast of San Francisco and it's called the Marianas Trench. And it's 33,000 feet deep. So that's 11,000 meters deep. So like I said, if you took Mount Everest, and if you took the biggest mountain range on the planet, I see Diego's asked a question there. Bear with me one second. Um, uh, and you put it in this, it would disappear. It's so deep. And then underwater, we also have seamounts. We have underwater volcanoes. And these underwater volcanoes form islands. So that's why you'll find a lot of the islands, as an example, in Hawaii, off the coast of the States, in the Pacific, they're all volcanic islands. And all these islands have come from underwater volcanoes, sometimes called seamounts. And then even before they reach the surface and the volcanoes erupt, you have a lot of animal life that lives on these seamounts. So just because you can't see what, um, what's under the water doesn't mean there isn't life there. There's plenty of life and it, it comes in different ranges and different depths. And a good example here, as, as you can see on the screen, is that if we took 100 Statues of Liberty, which are the, 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 obviously the, the welcoming statue that you see when you enter into New York, and you pile them on top of each other, and you put them, or you stack them on top of each other, and you put them into the, into the deepest areas of the ocean, they'd simply disappear. You wouldn't see them. So if you took the tallest, pretty much uh, the tallest building on land, I forget what it is now, and you put it into the deepest part of the ocean, chances are you wouldn't see it. So to give you an idea how deep it is, and of course in the deep water zones, what they call the abyssal zones, it's always very dark. And animals have ways to find food and, 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 and migrate in the dark, in total darkness. And they, have, they use different types of bacteria and they use loads of different techniques in order to survive on the water. I'll give you one example. Big sperm whales that you find on the surface, and we'll talk about whales in a minute, when they dive deep down into the, into the water to feed on squid, and big giant squid and sometimes colossal squid, they sit at the base uh, in deep water with their jaw open. And they have teeth probably the size of my arm and their conical teeth and they sit out from their lower jaw. And the best part about this, they have little bits of bacteria on their teeth that glow. So while they sit there like that with their jaw open, animals go, oh, what's that? 
oh, that's what's that shiny thing over there? And they go towards it. And of course, what they do is um, when they find out that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, they tend to get gobbled. So you, what I'm saying is that in even in deep environments where it's really dark and there's no light, animals use uh, bioluminescence, a bit like um, uh, fireflies and things like that as well. So they use, they use, they, they evolve and they try ways to deal with this, but it's a really, really wondrous place. And there's lots of little things like that. And you will find that certain fish also have lures and they have little lights in them as well. So when fish come towards to look at the lights, they get fed on them. And monkfish do that as well. So it's, it's quite a diverse place and lots of cool, interesting facts. But what I'm going to do now is probably, if you can see, is just talk about a number of species to give you an idea of the diversity. Um, I know Diego asked the question there. I, I will get to the questions if you bear with me just for a few more moments. Um, and, but I know there is questions. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about jellyfish. Jellyfish aren't really jellies. I mean, jelly, they're not fish. Um, but certain jellies, they're sometimes called sea jellies, um, but they are obviously commonly known as jellyfish. And lots of jellyfish are actually a colony of animals. So you'll find that a lot of animals are working together as one organism. And uh, a good example of that is a Portuguese man of war uh, that you see sometimes that'll swim, that'll be sometimes floating on the surface. Um, and they are a colony of animals that live together. These have been around since the dinosaurs. They've been around for 650 million years. And basically they, they, they were one of the first forms of life that have evolved before all the big predators came here. Um, as I said, such as the, um, uh, the big sharks and prehistoric sharks and prehistoric reptiles. Um, they're, they're very much they're ubiquitous across all oceans. Sometimes because they drift with the currents, when you're walking on the beach, you'll find them on the beach. Now, you can get stung by jellyfish. So I don't know if you guys have ever had a sting by a jellyfish, but I'll give you a little tip. If you ever get stung by a jellyfish when you're with your mum and your dad on the beaches and you're walking the beaches, first of all, don't pick the jellyfish up if you see it on the sand um, because they have stinging cells called uh, pneumatocysts and they have a little toxin in them and they sting. So if you get stung by a jellyfish, don't go, ow, ow, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, oh, it hurts, because you'll make it worse. So don't touch the area where, you're, where you've been stung by jellyfish. Because what happens is when you do that, when you touch it, you, you burst some of the stinging cells that will have come off the jellyfish on their tentacles. And so you'll actually have made it worse. You'll be in more pain and we don't want that. So what you can do is you, if, uh, when next time you go to the beach, bring a little bit of dad's shaving foam in a tin. And, and, and what you can do is if you get so you just put a little bit of that and then you can gently wipe it off and the shaving foam will take the stinging, the stinging cells off. Um, the other thing is, it's probably a bit ooh, is that um, if you can put we on it, you can put urine on it. And what that does is it basically uh, minimizes the sting. So you can you can actually probably, if it sounds silly and it sounds disgusting, but you're in pain, if you when you want to wee on yourself, you can do that and that will help as well. I know it sounds mad, but that's the truth. <laughs> so next time you come across a jellyfish and you get stung, don't hit it and go, and don't, don't go, ow, 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 ow. Find, find yourself some shaving foam. You can also use vinegar, vinegar that you'd have on your fish and your chips as well, if you have a bit of that too as well. But as I said, jellyfish are, um, there's many different types of them. They're also um, a great favorite prey item. In other words, they're eaten a lot by sea turtles. They're also eaten by fish. I am, um, many years of diving, I've seen a lot of sea turtles, uh, especially green sea turtles that are vegetarians. Um, because they don't, they don't, uh, they eat sort of seagrass and algae. Um, they eat jellyfish like this, and they they bite off little chunks like that off the jellyfish. And um, you have also seen jellyfish because they drift with the currents. You'll also see them get caught in the bubbles that you exhale as a scuba diver, and they sometimes twirl around as the bubbles get bigger and bigger and run out of steam. But essentially, where there are jellyfish, um, you'll find uh, sea turtles. And you'll also find different species of fish that follow them as well. But do remember, as I said, they're they're not um, they're not an individual organism. Uh, there's a colony of organisms, and you'll definitely find sometimes fish will swim with them, small fish, and they'll dart in amongst the uh, in amongst the um, the tentacles because they get protection. So sometimes what you'll find is that certain animals will get a, a free ride with different animals uh, in order to get protection and food scraps. But there's lots of them. As I said, they predate dinosaurs and um, you'll also find them in freshwater. 
in fact, there's one area in Polynesia, French Polynesia, which is the other side of the South Pacific, that when volcanoes erupted, it isolated populations of jellyfish. And as I said to you, jellyfish sting and uh, they use stinging cells to catch small fish. But because this population of jellyfish got uh, isolated in an in enclosed uh, uh, embayment or enclosed lake, um, in certain areas you can swim with them and they won't do any harm. And it's been millions of years that they've been isolated and they have no need for tentacles. So they, um, they've they evolved over time to have no stinging cells because they've had no predators and you can jump in the water with them. But do remember, next time you see a jellyfish, you know you know how to make yourself better if you're stung by it, but, but, but don't rub it. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. I'll get carried away because jellyfish are pretty cool. Um, so marine mammals and dolphins, um, uh, uh, there's a huge uh, plethora of them. We have in the UK, we have uh, harbour porpoises, which are quite small. Uh, we have uh, further afield, which is unfortunately quite uh, near to extinction. We have the vaquita, which is found in the Gulf of California. And then on the larger scale of it, we have the um, blue whale, which is the biggest mammal on the planet. And to give an example of how big a blue whale is, if you look at your mum and dad's car in the driveway now, chances are it's got sort of four doors and a hatchback and, and, and a boot. And generally, the heart of a blue whale is nearly as big as your mum and dad's car. That's how big the animal is. And if you wanted the, the veins that supply blood to the heart, you could swim down them. That's how big they are. They're colossal. So when, you, when you're getting into your mum and dad's two participants, I get there, I get there. Um, when, when next time you're going to school over the next couple of weeks um, and you're going out for a trip with your mum and dad in the car, just think how big a blue whale's heart is. It's the size of the car that you're in. Generally about a Volkswagen Beetle or, or a, small, a small car, but it's still quite big. So dolphins and whales are marine mammals and they breed air like you and me. And um, they're, very, they're very, very clever animals. Um, you'll find, yeah, for, for want of a better word, you'll find um, female dolphins are called cows and males are called bulls. And dolphins, as you know, swim in schools and pods. Extremely clever animals. They, um, they, uh, you can learn a lot from them. They're highly sociable and um, they adapt their, fooding, their feeding strategy depending on where they are. And they'll also take on sharks and they'll also put, as we say in Ireland, they'll also put manners on sharks. Um, so what I'll do is I'll say no more because I see some the questions are aligning there. So I'm going to just uh, I'm going to try and two participants have raised their hands. Um, if I if I how do I let these young ladies and gents answer the questions? Ka Alex, let me see. Alex, uh, ask to unmute. Go ahead, Alex. Is that OK? Oh, um, it's not about the question. I have to go. OK, no problem. Well, thank you for coming along. Yeah. See you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. OK. And now Austin, let's try Austin if you want to. Oh, go ahead, Austin. OK, fast on news. There you go. Austin. Sorry, Austin doesn't have a question. Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. That's all right. That's great. No problem. Uh, we go again. Um, here's the other one then. Let's see. Uh, keep it going. Um, You've got Diego, Finley, and then Sierra and Ethan. There you go, Diego. I'm asked you to unmute there. Go for Diego. So two things. One, I think you got oh, um confused. I think the Mariana Trench is actually between Japan and Papua New Guinea. At least that's what I heard. There's yes, there's the Philippine Trench, and then there's the Mariana Trench. The Mariana Trench is is actually off the coast of San Francisco. Um, but there's also the Philippine Trench, uh, which is um, of the other neck of the woods that you're saying. Um, but the, the, the general idea is that it's really deep. It's really, 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 really deep. And you'll be able to, um, this, you'll be able to put pretty much any landmass that you can think of and you can put it in there. But you will find, um, you will find in the Pacific, probably the easiest way to do it then is that the Pacific Ocean. Um, you've got the deepest areas, uh, uh, the deepest trenches in order to uh, uh, emphasize how broad and diverse it is. Did you say you had yeah. a question? Um, yeah. Also, what what made me very, what always confuses me 
is how the wh whales and dolphins are two quite they're quite heavy creatures and yet i see them throw themselves almost completely out of the water like how on earth could a whale get such propulsion that it throws itself out of the water excellent question excellent question well it's it's exactly that they have a huge musculature in other words they have a lot of muscle in their body um, and the reason they can throw themselves out of the water is called breaching is um there's a number of reasons why they do but the reason they can do that is that they have strong musculature really really well defined muscles that have highly oxygenated uh sort of just very rich in oxygen and and it's sort of a dark muscle um which basically means that you know when you're doing a bit of exercise you need to warm up dolphins can uh, and, and marine mammals can switch on like that they have highly oxygenated blood it's dark muscle and it's ready to go so when they see something they want to eat when they see something they want to play with and they need to go or remove themselves from the water they can do that sharks also have the same thing as well uh, and it's called dark muscle and the idea being that if an opportunity arises that they need to react fast and they need to be out of this they don't need to do their stretches they don't need to do their exercise they're just ready to go and then just flick the switch and then they're off to go but dolphins breach and whales breach for a number of reasons um, one of the reasons that, it, that they do it is that sometimes you'll see whales with lice and what they call parasites on their skin. And the idea being that when they launch themselves out of the water and they slap really heavily and they slap like a big belly flop, the water, the surface of the water, they dislodge some of the things that are annoying them on their skin. They also do it when they're showing off. They also do it when they're excited. They also do it for many, many reasons. But one of the things that scientists think they do this because they have as I said, parasites and lice and barnacles and things growing on their skin because they're always in the water. Um, and they, and they, they aggravate and they annoy the dolphins and the whale. Um, they jump up in order to release them. There is, um, there is one, uh, there's another, another reason why they do this, is that sometimes, sometimes you find um, uh, lamprey, uh, you find, not lampreys, you find remores, and they stick to the surface of the shark. And a remore is a fish with a modified dorsal fin and it sticks to its, it's the skin of the whale. And the idea being when they jump up, it dislodges the remora as well. So there's lots of reasons for that, but they're generally quite fit, they're generally active, and they've got lots of oxygenated muscles ready to go. And that's why they do these things. Is that okay? But Matt, we, we got a, we got some more there. Let's see. Um um, let's see who else uh, asked to unmute. There we go. I can't see the name of that. There you go. Who have I asked to unmute there? Sorry. Asked to unmute there. Is it Emily? Have I asked to unmute there? Did you get that? Is that okay? Yeah, I didn't have a question. Sorry. That's all right. That's no problem. Sorry if I missed you. Sorry about that. Um, I've got, um, it was, a, I'm just looking at the raised hands. Is there anything else? Um, we go to Finley next. Okay, no problem. We'll just go down. There we go. There we go. Look, the, the hands are in the air. Very, I've got my. Bear with me one second. Sorry, folks. Just trying to navigate all the different screens. I'm. Um, We've got. Uh, let me see. Oh, as to unmute, I can't see the name of this young lady with her hand in the air. Is that? I've got a question. Go for it. Are dolphins deadly? Can you say that again? Are dolphins deadly? Are dolphins deadly? Is that, is that the question? <laughs> um, not so much. They're probably deadly to smaller fish or other or other dolphins. Um, they um, they're generally not aggressive uh, to humans. They're generally not aggressive to uh, most humans in the water. Um, they, I guess like you and me can have a bad day, you know, and sometimes you might get a dolphin on a bad day who's a bit grumpy, but um, <laughs> most of the time they're, they're okay. But they, you, you um, I guess a bit like a puppy, if you've had a puppy or a dog who's a bit tired and, and, you, and it doesn't get a chance to rest or rejuvenate or relax, they can get a bit snappy and a bit grumpy. Um, but most <laughs> times they're not. I know actually dolphins have sometimes protected humans and they have 
they protect each other from sharks and other predators and orcas as well, uh, killer whales. Um, but you'll find that they're, they're not so much deadly, but they, they will kill each other. Um, they will do what nature's asked them to do and they will survive. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be as aggressive as, as maybe other species. They're a bit more, they're a bit more, but the right would be chilled. They're a bit more chilled. Mm -hmm. Also, my brother has a question. Um, do all species of dolphins, do all species of dolphins, I would like, like, is it true that they can, like, save humans during a shark attack and find people lost at sea? Yeah, I'm just going to switch. It makes life a little bit easier. Um, so you asked me, could they um, save humans as towards shark attack? I do know. Um, that shark, uh, dolphins have helped uh, humans um, from sharks. I'll give you one example. I think last year there was a lady swimming with um, uh, humpback whales in Tonga in the South Pacific, where you can go and swim with them. And this whale would not leave the lady's side. And the reason, and this lady was snorkeling as she was on the surface of the water, and she thought this was quite strange. And one of the reasons why the whale did not leave her side was there was a tiger shark nearby. So the whale actually protected her from the tiger shark because the whale was a lot bigger. But he was quite uh, nervous um, knowing that a tiger shark was around who would probably be interested in a human um, and uh, protect him. So there is, there is documented evidence of dolphins and whales. Uh, big and small, uh, helping protect um, humans from sharks. Um, and some some whales and dolphins are able to kill sharks. You'll also find that orca killer whales, who are very smart, will kill species of shark. And, and what they do is, um, a shark has, uh, does not have a rib cage like you and me. Um, you'll find that uh, big fish like tuna and big fish like cod and, and really large fish, uh, not mammals, they have a rib cage that protects them. But sharks don't have this. And sharks have skin, which is very, very tough. It's like sandpaper. And they say it's seven times tougher than leather. So the idea is that when an orca killer whale wants to harm or kill a shark, even a great white shark, a big shark, they, they attack their belly because they have no rib cage. So you'll find that depending on where you are, depending on how big you are, generally in the ocean, the bigger you are, the safer you are. Um, the, uh, your size helps protect you, but you'll find that whales and dolphins will, um, will actually help uh, humans and they will help other animals as well um, because they, they um they uh, they tend to they tend to take pity on the smaller critters um but of course don't forget they have to feed themselves as well so it's it's nature it's the balance of nature does that make sense can you still hear me have i switched things off yes i can i can hear you just uh, it, it went on mute that's okay that's very good what i'll tell you what i'll do I'll, okay. if, if you want to hold on to your questions just for a moment, I'll click on to the next couple of slides and then we'll have a few more questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, folks. Right. Well, what uh, I'll do is I'll just move on to the next slide. There's only a few more to go. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about octopus. Mm -hmm. um, octopuses are so amazing. Um, they can change color. And one of the most amazing things they do is they have pigment cells in their skin and they communicate through each other through these colors so you'll find that if a if a if an octopus or a cuttlefish uh, wants to communicate or a squid they'll have different colors in their skin and this will resonate um, years ago, scientists did a study where they got certain species of octopus and they left them over uh, and they put had them in an aquarium in the lab and they put chess boards underneath, which are black and white, black and white, black and white. And over time, they found that the octopus changed its color in order to camouflage itself in what hit, what they thought it was its natural environment. So you'll find that octopus are very very clever animals and they use uh, particular cells called melanophores which are color pigment cells to communicate with each other to camouflage and hide 
and then also to um, make sure that they can't be seen by predators by adapting to the environment that they're in. You'll also find that they have blue blood. Uh, most people have rich oxygen red blood, but they have blue blood and, and they have a beak like a parrot. So amongst this, the squashy body or the soft um, tissue like body they have, along with the suckers they have, they have a beak inside um, uh, as they use for their mouth. Now, many, many years ago, I worked in the Gulf of California and we were working with sharks. And when we opened up the stomach of sharks, we found that a lot of these beaks, which are parrot-like, were in the stomachs of sharks. So you'll find that these are like, they're made of the same stuff that your nails are made of, like keratin, very hard um, uh, protein-based keratin. And they, they last very, very long. It was the one thing that a shark couldn't digest and um, that we would found them in their stomachs. But they're very clever as well. I think, a couple of years ago, in one of the World Cups, um, they were, there was an aquarium that used to ask an octopus who was going to win each match. And uh, he, would, uh, there was, uh, he would pick which team would win by putting a flag or something in the tank. And he was quite right. So they might have mystical powers as well. But beyond that, they're quite clever. Um, you'll also find that octopus sometimes have an ability to attach shells to themselves. So what they'll do is they'll get two cockle shells or something a big shell and they'll pull them together and they'll hide in them like this and this is why uh, they're very very smart they adapt to the environment and um, you'll also find that octopus also um have uh, jet propulsion in other words they take the water in and then they squirt the water out in order to move and then what they also do is if they're um if they're attacked or if they're in danger they actually squirt ink they squirt a small jet of ink out. And the idea being that the predator, whatever it is, a shark, a dolphin, or whatever it is, or a seal, will go, oh, what was that? What was that? What's that black stuff over there? And they'll go and look at that. And then while they're looking at that, the octopus will get away. And one final thing about octopus, really, is that they're quite remarkable. Um, when the mother octopus is taking care of all the baby octopus, um, she basically, she, she, she will just stay with them until they have, they've grown into small octopus and then release them. And unfortunately after that, she dies. So what you find sometimes it's the ultimate sacrifice. An octopus will stay with the young developing octopi um, for as long as they need to be de uh, developed and she will take care of them. And unfortunately she won't survive, but they will. So you can't say that octopus don't care for their family because they very much do. They give up their life um, and they can lay an average of 200,000 eggs, depending on the are, and you can have small and big octopus. An actual fact, I meant to tell you this, there's a small octopus called the blue ringed octopus that lives in Australia. And when you're going rock pooling, you should stay away from this octopus. This is one of the most poisonous animals on the planet. And it's a small octopus about the size of my hand, and it has blue rings on it. And the toxin in it will stop your heart. So if you ever come across a blue ringed octopus, you just leave them alone and don't go near them. They won't bite you. They won't attack you. Generally, what they do is it's defense and they'll try and pr protect themselves by um, by poisoning the animal that's attacking them. So the number one rule is stay away from the blue octopus, even though it's only quite small. So the next time you're on holidays, all beyond COVID and you're in tropical environments, make sure you don't go near the blue octopus. Is that a deal? Right, okay, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so we spoke a little bit about whales. It's uh, the question we had earlier about breaching. You can see a little bit of, the, of, of a, a meme going there where the, where the whale breaches. Um, and, th and that's an example of, you know, the big muscular propulsion they use to jump out of the water and create splashes. The other thing I should have said about that is, is that the noise they make in the water when it splashes is, is, is a disturbance. And it lets other whales know that they're in the environment and it lets other marine animals know they're there. So it's a form of communication. The, the main thing to remember about whales is that not all whales are the same. Um, you'll see a picture there in the middle of what I took years ago of a sperm whale, as I mentioned earlier, and it's on its side with its lower jaw sticking out and it's playing with a coconut. 
there's a coconut floating on the surface and it's just mouthing the coconut and playing with it and you can just see its lower jaw there with the teeth that are coming out of it and um they're quite um they're quite amazing creatures to give an example they have an oil in their head they have a big head and they have an oil in their head and one of the reasons why they have the oil is that they heat the oil up and they cool the oil down and when they heat the oil up um, it becomes less it becomes dense and it helps them float and when they cool the oil down it helps them sink so it helps them dive and it helps them rise to the surface and you'll also find with sperm whales as an example they have suckers uh, marks on their heads and you'll see them sometimes they ram each other and they have big impacts but the one of the things you could look at i think last year a a, a couple of sperm whales washed up on beaches in norfolk and some and what they found was that they found big sucker marks on their skin and the reason being that when they dive deep down in order to get their prey, their squid, which they like, the squid knows that they breathe air. So the idea being the squid will try and keep the whale down for as long as it can to drown it in order to escape. It's quite, it's quite an amazing thing. Um, you'll also find that whales migrate huge distances. They can, they can circumnavigate across oceans. They can swim up to 30 miles an hour and they have all different forms of teeth. You'll find that the sperm whale has actual teeth like you and me. Um, other whales have plates. They're called baleen plates and they gulp water and then they feed um, on what's in the water and then they, they push out the water um, and they spit the water back out and they filter through baleen plates. So there's different types of animals um, and different types of whales. And they all, some of them go down to the seabed and they gulp up the seabed and they get all the animals that are in it and then they spit out all the sediment. Um, others, other whales will actually blow bubbles in a circle and they'll trap the the um the the uh, fish in a in a curtain of bubbles and then they'll come up and they'll gobble them, um and they're just quite they're you know they're they're quite diverse. You'll find um the size as I said before goes from a small vaquita which would be no more than a meter two meters in length so about five feet to something that would be over a hundred feet long a giant sperm whale as I said a giant uh, blue whale as I said who have the heart as big as your mum and dad's car um they're they they the amazing thing about whales and I've seen this myself is that they don't they only sleep with half their brain on so you might say does, does a whale go to sleep they do but they log on the surface and, and sometimes they stand, they, they, they support themselves upright in the sea, just underneath the surface. And they, and they keep half their brain on and they keep the other half off. And the idea being that if anything disturbs them, they're awake enough and be alert to it as well. They're just very, very smart critters. Um, and uh, they, have, um, they have limbs that have bone structures like our hands. And um, they're just, they circumnavigate and they dive to deep waters. I mean, you will find that actually leatherback sea turtles will dive deeper than whales. A sperm whale or most whales that dive deep would go down to a thousand meters deep. So that's three and a half thousand feet just to catch their prey and that they're quite diverse. But as I said at the top of the conversation, they're very, um, uh, they're very diverse and they have a lot of different behavioral traits to deal with this, uh, such as heating, cooling oil, um, the bacteria they use to grow on their teeth in order to trap food and their ability to hold their, um, to hold their breath in order to deep to these deep environments. So, and they have different types of teeth as well, but it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide. I, I realize time is of the essence and I'm getting carried away as usual. Um, I'll just skip about oysters and clams because I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, seahorses and sea turtles. Um, these are probably the cutest animals on the planet in my, in my, in my opinion. There's over 50 species of seahorses and they, um, they, one of the most curious facts about these guys is they don't have a stomach. So seahorses don't have a stomach and they have to keep continually feeding. 
and they feed on the things I showed at the start at the, at the start of the presentation, which is on plankton, zooplankton and phytoplankton, which are small little fish eggs and small microscopic creatures. And um, they they use camouflage. And this is a really interesting point. If we look at the yellow seahorse here, just on the left hand side, you'll find little bits of white, which is kind of fluff that grows on them. And the idea being that this is camouflage. They have a little bit of bacteria and algae that grow on them and they cultivate this in order to make them look like a sea sponge or make them look like um, a, a vase sponge or something that is on a coral reef. And the idea being that they're camouflaged and they help this algae grow on them in order to camouflage themselves. So they like to, um, they like to cultivate and they like uh, things to grow on them, which is quite interesting. But they also move very quickly. Uh, they, they can move very quickly if you want, but they're, they're, they're not very fast swimmers. But you'll also find if when, when you're diving or when you're snorkeling, you'll find a seahorse would pretty much be in the same area you found on the day before. And of course, when when they're looking after the eggs and the small seahorses, it's the male that broods them as well as opposed to the female. Um, they have really good eyesight and they find um, um, they, they, they find food um, uh, in their local area and it comes by in currents as well. And the most cutest thing ever is that sometimes you'll find seahorses in pairs, a mummy and daddy seahorse, and every morning they have a ritual and they will come along and they'll say hello to each other and then they'll go back to where they were but they, they, but they do this all the time which is very very cute and very nice to see i do have a question i see some guys have asked a question there bear with me one second i think grace do you want to do you want to ask a question was that okay no okay no problem let me just see uh who else who was asking a question there i'm just going through the screen folks um okay i see young milo there you go you want to ask a question is that okay go for sir Oh, yeah, you're good. Um, have you? I have a couple of questions. And have you ever swam with manta rays? Yes, I have. I have. Um, majestic, beautiful little creatures. And I've also seen one born. And it, 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 um, and uh, it was in Mexico. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the mother was caught in a fishing net. Um, but the professor I was working with at the time, he said, watch this, Ron. And he pushed on her abdomen and out came a small little teeny weeny alive manta ray. And it glistened in the sun. It was absolutely magnificent. And we put it back in the sea. I promise you, it's the most glorious, colorful thing you'll ever see. It's magnificent. So, But when you're in the water with them as well, you just, you just watch them glide through the water like bats through the air. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, and they have loops that you know, their mouthpieces are looped and the idea being that as they swim to plankton it generates a little loop that basically feeds into their mouth but they're they're wondrous creatures and of course they're also called cartilaginous and they're also relatives of sharks they're like flattened sharks but yes i have i've been very lucky um they're really wondrous creatures um in mexico i think they sometimes call them devil rays because the fishermen think if a fisherman fell overboard the manta rays come back and they take them down to the deeps and then the fisherman comes back up and he's turned into a manta ray so mm -hmm. that's just folklore <laughs> go ahead Milo. any more questions um can you get stingrays in the uk uh stingrays in the uk you can get the you can get thornback rays and they would have the back of them would be like a stingray it'd be very hard and it would do you some harm the sting you can get flattened stingrays yes you can but when you say stingray are you thinking of a stingray with a venomous barb on it that would um that they use to protect themselves but yeah you can, yeah you, you, you can get species of the same family here but you wouldn't get that species the one that you're thinking of is what they call daisyatus americana which is a flattened one and they have a venomous barb which is probably easily the length of this pen and the main interesting thing about this, because I've seen them, is that they, the, 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 the barb is like an arrowhead all along. So the idea is that when it goes into something, it's very difficult to take out. And of course, it also has bacteria on it as well, which will cause you harm. So another tip, if you're ever in water where there are stingrays, um, yeah. make sure you shuffle your feet. So when you walk into the sea, shuffle your feet and make a noise with your feet. Never just jump straight in and go, yeah. 
yay you know shuffle your feet because anything in the sand will then be disturbed and it will leave so don't go near the blue ring octopus and shuffle your feet when you're in shallow water when you're near stingrays and also um do they gather near rocks stingrays yes they do um sometimes and cliff edges yes they sometimes can and i'll tell you why because some marine mammals like to eat stingrays and also also species of sharks and sometimes when they're exposed they will go towards the rocks and they'll try and they'll try and hug the rock so they can't be pulled off the rock uh, as a survival technique but um, most of the time you'll find them on the seabed you'll find them covered in the sand that they're under and that they'll, they'll, they'll live under the uh, the outfall or crops or ledges of rocks where they can be uh, protected but don't forget, stingrays and, yes. and, and, and rays are also relative to the sharks. And I think from memory, there's at least six to 800 species of ray, huge amounts from the biggest to the smallest. Mm. Um, okay. uh, I have one more question. Go on. What kinds of sharks do we have in the UK? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there's about 30 species of sharks in the UK. Um, you'll find basking sharks, which are the second biggest sharks on the planet. Um, and they have plankton feeders, um, they wouldn't do any harm. And you'll find, uh, actually find species uh, of, of hammerhead at different times of the year. You'll find poor, poor beagle, you'll find um, dogfish, taupe, um, you'll find lots of different species. Um, uh, as I said, there's probably about 30 species in the UK, but depending on the time of the year, depending on the temperature of the water, you'll get different species coming close to the UK waters. But don't worry, we don't have great whites. You won't get nibbled. and uh, We don't have aggressive sharks that'll take a bite out of you. Um, that won't happen. Um, but yeah, we have about 30 species of sharks in the UK. And um, depending on where you are and where you're fishing, you might come in. Blue sharks are a good example because they migrate from America all the way down to Portugal and they pass the UK. So yeah, about 30 odd species, but we have quite a few. It probably for some of your homework, if you wanted, you, could, you, could, you can check out the different species that are there, but there are quite big and small ones, big and small ones. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. Right, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Thanks. I'll just, go on. Any more questions? I'm just gonna jump on the sea turtles because I want to show you something. So sea turtles are probably my second most favorite critter on the planet. I've been so lucky to, to, to live and work with a lot of sea turtles. Um, and um, I just wanted to get the point across that they're all endangered. So there's seven stroke, eight different types of species of sea turtles in the world. Some of them are vegetarians. Some of them like to eat jellyfish. Some of them like to eat crabs. And some of them can grow really, really big. Um, the biggest sea turtle ever caught to date was a leatherback. And you can actually find him in Cardiff Natural History Museum in Wales. So when you can travel next time you're in Cardiff, go to the Natural History Museum and you'll see the leatherback. And he was caught in 1988 uh, and he was over a ton in weight. So the fishing vessel where he got, he, he got brought in, unfortunately he drowned accidentally in the net. They brought him into the History Museum and you can see him there. But the difference with the leatherback is they don't have a hard shell. They have bone with cartilage, just what's in your ear, the same thing. And the idea being because when they dive deep, their shell compresses due to the pressure of the water. Whereas other sea turtles have hard shells. And this is why I wanted to show you this. I don't know if you can see it. This is a hawksbill sea turtle shell. And this is, this is the, just to give you an idea, this is a small sea turtle. And just to, these are sometimes called, um, these, these are called scoots. These are different layers. And what you'll find is underneath, they have a backbone like you and me. And then they have different layers of the scoots or the scales on top. And this once was a sea turtle, unfortunately it drowned in a, in a net. And of course, sea turtles are endangered. So um, specimens like this are only really used for educational purposes. Um, and the idea being that this is a small sea turtle because sea turtles can take up to 50 years before they come mature. Only one, and this is crazy, only one in a thousand sea turtle eggs will make it to adulthood up to 50 years from now. So only one will make it. And then the same sea turtle that was born on that beach they will come back to the beach where they were born or the area they were born because they memorize, this is amazing, they memorize the Earth's magnetic field on that beach. 
And then basically they, they, memor they memorize the coordinates, a bit like on Google Maps. They memorize the coordinates and then they go back to that beach when they're old enough to lay eggs. But all sea turtles are endangered. Um, if anybody wants to see this, let me know. I'll, I'll drop it off and I'll let you guys have a look at it. It's no problem. But this is a hawksbill sea turtle. This is endangered and it has a beak like a hawk, but it's sometimes the shell is referred to like shingles on a roof, like on your house. And that's the way they're layered. But you can see this is a very old sea turtle as an old shell and all the different, you could see where the backbone was and all the different uh, sort of rib, uh, similar rib bones were there. Can you guys see that? You can? Is that okay? That's okay. Well, just to give you an idea, but they're very wondrous creatures and there's lots of stuff going on. I know I can't show you in person, but uh, th th just wanted to share that with you. I think I've got two more slides to go and then we can ask a few more questions if you want. I don't mind, um, but there's lots. Um, oh, my favorite species. I won't go on too much about these. I'll just tell you a little bit about sharks. Um, as I said, there's 600 odd species of sharks. The most amazing things, we've got two questions there. We'll get to that in a sec. The most amazing thing is that a shark can smell one drop of blood in 10,000 parts of water, which is the size of an Olympic swimming pool uh, from about one kilometer away. It's, and I'm talking a teeny weeny drop of blood. They have really, really good developed sense of smell and they can they can um, find uh, any disturbance or blood or oil or or any any substance that they that might have a smell in the water they've existed for millions and millions of years and as i said they've um they've adapted uh, over the years in from evolutionary terms from really small sharks to big sharks and from big dinosaurs they did exist when the dinosaurs were around you'll also find that different shark have different teeth and the different teeth are designed for what they eat and their teeth can change as they get older. Um, so there's a lot of different things there as well. But do remember, as I said, they're made of cartilage. They don't have any bones. They have a backbone. And um, along the side of the shark, they have small teeth and they can bump off objects and they can taste things through their skin. Imagine that if you bumped off something, you could taste things through your skin. So their skin is, as I said, has, has, has teeth on it and they're sometimes called dermal denticles. And those teeth are used to protect them because their skin is quite tough. Um, and it, they're, as I said, they're absolutely mind blowing critters. They've existed for millions of years. And a single shark can have between uh, six to 15 rows of teeth at any one time. And the teeth are, are loosely positioned in their jaws. So sometimes when you're on the beach, uh, uh, when you get out on the beach, you can go fossil hunting and you'll sometimes find fossils of shark teeth. There was a question there before we moved to plastics. Who I'm just trying to find who was that nice person wanted to ask the question. Finley's had his hand up for quite a while. No problem. Sorry about that, Finley. I'll just try and find you now. Uh, bear with me one second. I'm just going through, sorry, Oscar's got his hand up. I'm just going to try Finley. I'm trying to find Finley. I can't find Finley. Have you disappeared, Finley? I've unmuted him. Go ahead, Finn. Thank you. So um, I touched a jellyfish once and it didn't sting me. Are there certain types that didn't don't sting you? That's correct. There is not all jellyfish will sting you. You're absolutely correct. Um, there's an example would be the lion's mare jellyfish, which has lots of tentacles from it, or even the upside down jellyfish, which I show you there. Um, you're right. Not all jellyfish will sting you. But as a rule of thumb, it's best not to mess with them just in case it is a jellyfish that might sting you. Also, um, I have a really small shark too. Yeah. It wasn't from this country. It's from Italy, but it was like so much compared to the ones on the screen. So, how will like would that come from a small shark or a big shark? Um, it depends. As a general rule, Finley, um, if you were a big shark, um, you will find that um, let's see, as as a rule of thumb. They say about an inch of each from the base of the shark's uh, enamel to the tip of the shark's tooth. Uh, they say each inch equates to about a meter of the shark's length. So if you have a five inch tooth, that would probably come from a five meter shark. But the other thing you need to look at the shark teeth is that, is the tooth serrated? Does it have sharp edges either side or is it smooth? Hang on. <laughs> Is that 
450 million years old or something. So it's a fossilized shark tooth. I think. That's okay. That's fine. Because to help you identify what the shark is, um, you probably from a cow or a frilled shark. Um, and they have, a, they have a number of small teeth and they feed on sort of small organisms that live near the seabed or in that area. Um, and the, the reason why I ask is that in the picture I have here, the tooth that, that sort of elongate and smooth is from a mako shark. And their teeth are designed like that because they're very, very fast swimming and they chase tuna. So what they do is rather than chewing and taking a bite out of something, they grasp it and then pale it on the teeth and then they, they eat it straight away whole. Whereas the other tooth beside it is a juvenile great white shark tooth. And it's probably about it's probably about this big. It's probably about that big. But it's you can see how sharp the serrations are. And the reason being that it likes to take bites out of things and then come back to it. And then you'll see the other picture is a um, is a reef shark. It's actually a Caribbean fossilized Caribbean reef shark. Um, and it's flattened as well and at a different angle. So different sharks teeth will tell you what type of shark it is and what they normally feed on. So your, your fossilized shark tooth is, um, it may be from a frilled or a cow or a, a cow shark um, uh, that you existed 250 to 300 million years ago, but um, there's lots of them about. So I like to collect shark teeth um, from extinct uh, and uh, fossilized shark as well. Does that help? Yeah, I have them in the telly and if that helps. Say that again, I, I missed you, sorry. I have a name in a French Italian. I think it might be French. Okay. Inete de Tibrun. No worries, no, no worries. Good. I've never met a French fossilized shark, so it's always good to know they exist. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, what I'll do is I'll just, I've got two more slides and I'll be very quick. Um, it was just to say that Plastic is one of the biggest problems we have in the, in, the, in, the, in the oceans at the moment, along with climate change and pollution and many other things. But the one thing that we need to do is make sure that plastic doesn't work its way into the marine environment. Plastic has been found in the animals that I've been speaking to you. It's been found in the whale, in the stomach of whales, in the stomach of sea turtles, in the stomachs of seals and fish. And of course, you also have to remember if we all like our fish, who is at the top of the food chain? So plastic can work its way through the food chain. Um, you can see the figures there. There, you know, over one million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals have been killed by ocean plastic. So, it, as I said, if there's the wondrous critters that are in the marine environment, um, if we can do one thing for them, even though we're quite landlocked in St. Ives, um, it's just to keep plastic out of the sea. Um, Moving on to the, to, the, to the second to last slide, it's very much, um, if you wanted to look at all the different types of plastics that work their way out into the marine environment, the one thing you need to look at is that big pieces of plastic like this bottle of water here, they actually break up eventually into small pieces of plastic and they fragment. And it's the small pieces of plastic that causes the biggest problem. So a problem gets bigger as the plastic gets smaller. So the idea is that we must make sure that we manage and we, we don't get make uh, we don't let plastic get into the environment. We recycle it. We, we if we don't need to buy plastic, we don't buy it. Um, as an example, for those of you guys who go shopping with your mum and dad, Aldi, which is the supermarket not far from here, um, they now have Easter eggs that are designed in cardboard boxes rather than plastics. So we're all doing our bits in order to make sure plastic doesn't move into the ocean. As you can see, I see Kira has a question there. I'll come to you in one second, Kira. Um, um, the there's eight million tons of plastic uh, works its way into the ocean every day. They say, and we, and in order for the oceans to be healthy and regulate and protect us and protect our weather and protect our food source and protect all the important ecosystem services they provide. Um, and uh, and the enjoyment as well. Who doesn't like being by the sea? We got to keep plastic out of the ocean. So, I there's lots of information there, and I'll share this with you guy afterwards. Um, I'm happy to do that. If there's anything I can do, if you want any information more on plastic, that's a whole another different talk, and I'm happy to do that. But I just wanted to share this with you. But I know Kira had a question there. Kira, I can unmute you if you want to ask your question. Um. Um, how is it that many fish? 
Say that again, Kira. You broke up a little. The bandwidth slow. Can you see that again, Kira? It got quiet. Is that okay? No problem. No problem. We'll come back to it. I, I'm happy to answer the questions after again. So basically, that's it. Sorry, folks. I got carried away. I I um I tried to give you an idea of all the different wondrous marine critters that live in the oceans, um, the different types of animals and their super duper um, uh, abilities and what they do and how they interact and made sure that the next time you get stung by a jellyfish, you know what to do. And um, you don't go near the blue ringed octopus and you shuffle your feet in the water with stingrays. And um, you just appreciate the super critters that we have in the sea and try and keep plastic out of it. So what I'll do is, I'll say thank you to everybody. You've been so patient. I do get carried away and I'm sorry about that. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'm happy to take any more. But for that, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, shall we go over to Oscar next? He's got a question. Um, how do dolphins catch their prey? Well, great question, Oscar. Um, they sometimes use um sonar uh, and they fire a noise or a sound and they stun the prey temporarily and, uh, and then they, they they manage to catch them so they use sound they use sort of um stun like 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 rays rays of sound and they stun the prey they sometimes dig their prey out of the um sand in the seabed so what they'll do is they'll go along the seabed and they'll use their nose like a, a bottle nose and they'll dig in the sand and they'll dig deep and deep and deep and they'll pull the, the fish out or sometimes they'll chase them into the shallows and they'll go on their side and they'll 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 make sure the fish is out of the water and because dolphins can breed air that's okay for them. And then they chase their fish up onto a river bank and then they slide back down. So there's many, many different types. Um, generally what they do is, and they can also stun them with their tail and they can also do many, many different ways. They're very clever. And they also share food as well. Um, you'll also find that some dolphins will catch, I've seen this in Egypt, they'll catch a, a fish that's called a unicorn fish and they'll break off the spine it has on its head and they'll share it with their, 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 their um, sons and daughters. Is that okay? Thank you. No problem. Right, should we go to Sia and Ethan next? Um, about what you said earlier about like getting to like get the turtle shell, can yep. we? How, how did I get the turtle shell? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Um. When I worked in the Caribbean, um, uh, a number of fishermen sometimes when they're fishing accidentally catch sea turtles, and sea turtles, as you know, breathe air. And unfortunately, sometimes if the nets are not checked frequently, they can drown. So I made a deal with the fishermen. I said, if you give me that shell, I'll use it to educate uh, future generations on how endangered sea turtles are. So that even though the sea turtle unfortunately died in a fishing accident, we'd still use the shell. And that's how I have the shell. And that particular shell, which I'll show you again, as I said, is from a hawk's bill and is critically endangered. And a critically endangered sea turtle it means that there's less than 20,000 of them in the world, which is very, very rare. So this one isn't a fully grown sea turtle for a hawksbill. This would have been probably about 20, 25 years old and um, because they can get much bigger. Um, but the idea being that I said to the fisherman, I said, I'll show you I'll, if you give me that shell because it won't go to waste because it's made of bone and, and, and cartilage. Um, and I will show it to uh, as many people as I can to let them appreciate how beautiful turtles are. Sometimes, and this is not the right thing to do, people catch sea turtles and use their shells to make jewelry and to sell to tourists. So we should never really do that. And my honest opinion is you should never buy these things because people then creates demand for them to go and get them. So this was an accident but we try and make it positive so people can see how gorgeous and pretty they are. Is that okay? Okay. You got a question, Sia? Yeah. Um, so, 
So if I were to swim with sharks in like if I was like able to go into like a tank with sharks and swim with them, would they be dangerous? No, not so much. Um the biggest danger to sharks is actually humans. Believe it or believe it or not. If you wanted to swim with sharks, um certain species of sharks will don't mind you at all. They won't mind you at all. I've been very lucky. I've swam with with six gill sharks, which are prehistoric sharks, great white sharks you see here on the screen, uh, tiger sharks, lemon sharks, and nine out of ten times they won't do you. They won't pay any interest to you. Um, you will find of the six hundred species of sharks I mentioned, ten maybe 12, maybe 15, um, you just have to be cautious of. It's like different dogs. Some dogs are very cute and cuddly. Some dogs are very bark. They bark a lot and a bit yappy. Some of them are a bit grumpy and a bit aggressive. Um, and certain species of sharks can be like that. But if you want to swim with sharks, you can. Um, but you just have to make sure that you behave yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't poke them. You don't. You don't be aggressive towards them. You, you're a visitor in their world. So when you're going visiting your friends and you're in 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 their house, you be, you you behave yourself and you you know you just you just you don't you don't you're not rude. So if you want to swim with sharks, you can. It's just uh, you just have to do a lot of research. You just have to learn how to scuba dive, and um, you just have to be quite mannerly. And uh, some sharks shouldn't need to be in a cage, um, but uh, I wouldn't worry about too much of that. That's more to protect the sharks from you rather than from, rather than the shark them from you, the shark from them. Does that make sense? All right. We we'll go to Kieran and Lexi next. Are axolotls in the sea? You're quite quiet there. Say that again. Are axolotls in the sea? I must be going deaf in my old age. I didn't get that. Are axolotls in the sea? Are what in the sea? My apologies. I'm sorry. Axolotls. Yes, they are uh, axolotls. Ah, um, no, you won't find axolotls in the sea. Axolotls are are sort of freshwater salamanders. Um, I, for a minute there, I was thinking of nautilus. I don't know why. Um, Axolotls are freshwater uh, critters. Um, and the amazing thing about, uh, because they have their gills exposed as well, but the amazing thing I, can, I know from axolotls is that they can regenerate limbs. They can regrow limbs. So uh, it's quite amazing, but you won't find axolotls in salt water. You'll find them in fresh water. But they're, do, you, do you like axolotls? No, when my friends do though. Oh, okay. Well, that, they're they're quite they're prehistoric animals because nature has evolved gills to be protected um, in freshwater fish and freshwater reptile species. But axolotls are quite different because they have their gill rakers exposed. That's why they look like they do. But you won't find them in the sea, but you will find them in the freshwater. All right, we'll go to Kira next, and then conscious of time. So afterwards, we'll go to Finley. I didn't have a question, it was only Lexi. <laughs> no problem. We go across to Finley then. So a, a sea snake's aggressive, like snakes that in the water, that are they aggressive to like sharks and, uh, and humans? Uh, sea snakes are generally not aggressive to humans, um, but it's a very good question. Sea snakes are highly venomous. They are really, really venomous and they will kill you if you get bitten by a sea snake. Um, they're not aggressive to humans. Um, and they don't have any reason. I, I don't know of any recorded incidents of humans being attacked by sea snakes. Um, there is, uh, the amazing thing about sea snakes is that there's another animal that looks exactly like a sea snake and it's called a sea crat, K or A I T. And it mimics exactly, it looks exactly the same as a sea snake. And any in the animal world, in the marine world or the animal world, if you're brash and bright and literally showing yourself off, pe uh, animals will know you to be a bit toxic. Nudibranchs do that, which are snails without shells. And anything that's bright or vibrant or colorful, generally animals tend to stay away from. 
But sea snakes, um, just like the name suggests, they gulp air. So when they go to the surface um, the, to breathe air, that's the time you want to stay away from them. Um, and they also lay eggs uh, on, in, on rocky outcropes on, on beaches as well in tropic environments. But you don't want to ever harass a sea snake. Um, if one swims towards you, it's not swimming towards you. You're just in its way. You can just move out of the way. But I don't I know people have been bitten by them, but I haven't heard of fatalities. But if you do get bitten by a sea snake, it's, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. So you want to stay away from them. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rowan, for coming along and talking about that. I certainly found it fascinating. I hope everybody else did. Um, I will spare everybody shouting thank you down their microphones. <laughs> that might do something funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Callum, and thank you for everybody having patience. And I do, I do apologise. I get carried away, but there's just such wondrous stuff out there. And if you get a chance to experience it, you should definitely grab it by both hands. Except the sea snakes, don't grab them. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. No problem. Thank you, folks. Have a good time. Take care. Bye bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 How do I leave? Can I just press Bye, everyone. Bye.